recently there's actually been quite a lot of discussion around concussions. However, it's been a lot less heard about sub-concussive trauma. So what's the difference between these two types of head injuries? What are the long and short term effects they have on the brain? Well, starting with concussion, what's also known as mild traumatic brain injury. This occurs when a blow to the head results in a loss of consciousness or a short-term impairment of the neurological function as the neurons in the brain are temporarily switched off or the signals that they're transmitting don't actually reach the intended destination. With a subconcussive trauma, however, the impact is less severe than with a concussion. The person won't display some of the normal symptoms of concussion, but the impact will still be severe enough to cause an injury to the brain. When the skull receives an impact severe enough to cause a concussion, the brain also moves as a result of that impact. One could consider the brain to be a three pound jelly floating in a small pool of liquid encased in a really sturdy box. Because the box is so strong and so sturdy, it's almost impossible under normal circumstances to damage it. So the brain inside the box is actually protected from direct damage. However, like when you move a jelly fairly rapidly, some parts move quicker than others, and the shape can distort for a while before returning back to its original form. Additionally, the jelly can bounce backwards and forwards for a short time after the initial movement. And during this rocking movement and change of shape, some of the neurons may cease to function or lose their connection, much like wiring an extremely complicated electronic device to come loose when it's shaken. The details of what occurs in the brain are rather complex, so I'll give you just a quick summary. During the shaking, the membrane of the neurons in the brain are disrupted and the potassium then flows out of the neurons. This in turn depolarizes and suppresses the neuron, making it difficult to transmit a signal across the brain. To fix the problem, potassium actually has to be forced back into the neurons by means of the sodium potassium ion pump, which requires substantial amounts of energy. Now this puts a tremendous strain on the cells and some of the cells may not be able to cope and die result. This crisis may take up to four weeks to resolve before the balance has been fully restored and those cells that are left are able to function as they did before the injury. It can also mean that the brain is now more vulnerable to damage than it was before. It will take a smaller impact next time to cause a second concussion than it did the first time around. Consequently, even quite a long time after someone's had a concussion, there will still be some difficulty with brain function, especially in regards to the lesser used pathways in the brain. Also, because the brain as a whole has been disrupted, there isn't a specific area of the brain which is affected. Instead, there's a general decline in the brain's ability to process information. After the concussion has occurred, the body is carrying out a rather major repair on the system. The last thing it needs is to divert essential resources elsewhere. It means that rest avoiding strenuous activity at key parts of the recovery process. Alongside this, eating regular, healthy meals and avoiding alcohol would also be beneficial to the recovery process. Now, because concussion or mild traumatic brain injury is relatively easy to spot with symptoms like loss of balance, memory loss, blacking out, double vision, it should be fairly easy to get the proper care for someone who's had a concussion. What of subconcussive trauma? Although subconcussive trauma lacks a kind of dramatic single kind of knockout blow, with each ding, bump, or collision, the brain is still bouncing around like a jelly, just not to the same extent as in a concussion. It means with multiple subconcussive traumas, especially if they occur over a relatively short space of time, those injuries may actually result in the same amount of damage to the brain as a concussion. However, because there hasn't been that single major event that occurs with a concussion, the person on the receiving end wouldn't get the same level of attention as someone diagnosed with a concussion. They may just be told to shake off any problems they may be feeling. It's of course very bad advice to end anyone who's had several minor injuries in succession and is showing some of the signs of concussion really should be following a similar protocol as for someone who's had a concussion. They could do for themselves substantial long-term damage. As this problem of substantial long-term damage has also been the focus recently of concussions. But, should it also be considered for sub-concussive trauma? The concern is that people suffering several concussions may develop CTE, or chronic traumatic 
and capital of Italy. Years after head injuries have occurred, the condition was described as being punch drunk. This was noticed especially in heavyweight boxers who have taken too many heavy blows to head during their boxing careers. And whilst these boxers did suffer from concussions, they also had large numbers of sub-concussive traumas as well. It was difficult to know for sure which was the most significant cause of CTE. The evidence now appears to indicate, however, the major factor in developing CTE isn't having a couple of concussions, but instead it's having a large number of sub-concussive traumas. One of the major factors in long-term damage that results in CTE is the age of the person when the damage is actually occurring. The brain is continually growing and developing throughout someone's life. The major growth and development and specialisation continues until about the age of 25. It means that any damage that's occurring whilst the brain is developing will have more significant effects than those that occur when the brain is fully developed. This problem is exacerbated by other factors such as a small body size or weaker neck muscles at a younger age means that any shock to the body or head at a young age result in a more violent head movement than would otherwise be the case, in turn resulting in more potential damage to the brain. This kind of scale for this, up to the age of three, the brain is growing very rapidly and is exceedingly vulnerable to damage, so even vigorously shaking a baby can cause damage to the brain. Now by about the age of seven, many children are interested in physical games and sports. However, studies indicate that sports which involve the use of the head in a physical manner between the ages of about 7 to 12 dramatically increase the problems with the brain later on in life. This means it's probably safe to avoid those games at this age and to closely monitor any injuries that occur to those types of games if they played after the age of 12. So to sum up, whilst a lot of attention has been focused on potential damage caused by concussions, the elephant in the room is really sub concussive trauma.